Okay, so I was initially cautious but optimistic about what awaited me past the Soul Society. And so far, it's better than anything that I've come across in this story. Soul Society or otherwise. It's got wacky characters, interesting plot developments, believable reasons to drag previously established characters back into the fray, and it has some of the best designs in the series so far. It's just really fun, and I can't believe where I am with this series now. 240 chapters in, and I genuinely think Bleach is awesome. So, it begs the question, what the hell is up with the differences between the anime adaptation and the original manga? Ten years ago, my first experience with Bleach took place and it really didn't connect with me then. I found characters annoying and for one reason or another, just ended up dropping the series entirely. However, now, after having read the manga, characters like Orihime, Khan, and, as I'm realizing more and more through this arc, Ichigo's father, are all far more complicated, compelling, and likable than the anime itself led me to believe. And I find this personally strange because this seems to be something that splits the fandom of Bleach as a whole, pun not intended. In other words, there are those that agree with this positive manga sentiment 100%, and there are those that don't seem to be bothered by these differences and love what the anime uniquely offers. I'm not suggesting either are wrong here, but I guess it goes to show how massive the difference in experience can be between two groups with slight preferential differences, making Bleach one of the most pronounced cases of this I've yet come across in my journey. In the anime, I found the father to be kinda creepy and massively irritating, but in the manga, he's around far less, thus making his random physical intrusions much more novel than annoying, and the same could be said for Khan. However, Orihime was another story. She was a character I pigeonholed as a one-note fanservice type character with little to no substance beyond what she offered on the surface through gag humor. However, now after having read the manga, she is unironically my second favorite character in this story, particularly after having read this week's material, with her struggling to reconcile her self-worth and ability as it applies to those she cares about. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is, if you haven't had a good experience watching Bleach's anime, then try out the manga, it worked for me. And if the manga didn't tickle your fancy, then maybe the anime is for you. Because personally, I am just blown away by how different an experience the manga has delivered me. No more am I waiting to be let down by this story. Now, I am thrilled to keep reading and to see what more Mr. Kubo has to offer me. And it makes me wonder also, if he had any issues with the way the anime handled his characters personally. Anyways, without further ado, let's dive into the first invasion and my thoughts on this arc so far. Okay, so from the outset, we know I loved my read-through of this week's material. However, I went into it feeling a certain level of trepidation. Following the conclusion to the Soul Society, I questioned whether or not Kuba would be able to, in a satisfying fashion, leave enough unanswered to interest and excite me for the next arc to utilize. Certainly, there's the unanswered terror surrounding Aizen and all that he represents as a threat to the story. However, that would be enough to grip me as a reader personally. We never launched into the Soul Society to bring security and safety to that world or even our own. It was instead all driven by the interpersonal relationships long since established from the beginning of the story. And that was more than enough for me. It's sort of what the heartbeat of Bleach has been, Ichigo's relationships with his friends and allies. Why did we travel into the Soul Society to protect a dear friend we had justifiably grown attached to over the course of the story? And once we achieved that, there was a wonderful sense of catharsis that flooded forth from the pages knowing that Ichigo and his pals had traveled to hell and back and succeeded in their mission to set their friend free. This is why in the end when Rukia decided to stay behind, it felt reasonable and final. She had served her purpose in the story it felt and so this seemed like the perfect ending for her and indeed the dynamic that drove the story forward from the beginning. And make no mistake, this is what drove the story, not Aizen, not the looming threat of something dogmatic and terrifying. That sort of incident what gets the readers into the position to enjoy these titanic battles between the likes of Luchi and Luffy, Goku and Frieza, or Naruto and Sasuke, are the friendships that acted as the backbone behind their reasoning being there. Whether it be Naruto's devotion to saving a friend from himself, Luffy's promise to grant Robin's wish to live, or the heroes of Earth in Dragon Ball traveling to the void unknown in search of a way to bring their lost comrades back to life. Every single one of these iconic battles manifested first and foremost because of an emotional connection or deeper reasoning beyond wanting to bring 
justice to a particular group of people we aren't too familiar with. In other words, fighting wasn't enough. And fighting on its own isn't enough for me either. In the same way Frieza wasn't enough of a reason to bring us to Namek, Aizen isn't enough on his own to bring us back into conflict unless there's an emotional component. So what did I think of how this arc kicked things off? Well, I really, really liked it. And it might be the best part of the series so far in my book too. Setting the scene. As I mentioned, Soul Society was fun, and I assume great for the time. And to this day, it still remains, for me, a solid piece of storytelling. It had a few hiccups here and there, I would have liked a bit more necessary secondary character involvement, and I would have liked that the twist ending with Aizen be a bit more satisfying. But outside of that, the arc itself deals with some really interesting plot points, does some interesting character exploration for the likes of Ichigo, and sets the bar fairly high for the series in terms of action. It's a competent story, beginning to end, and while I didn't notice any major issues with the Soul Society's introductory sequence either, I also wasn't as excited to read through it mostly because I sort of had an idea as to where it would otherwise go. Competent as it was, it was still a very traditional and conventional shonen story packed with all the trappings you might expect from the genre. Again, not a bad thing and I did enjoy it, but something I've learned that I can rely on the Arankar arc to do consistently is surprise me with its direction and application of existing characters. Remaining true to the foundation set upon prior arcs all the while managing to string me along with a host of choices I both found surprising and captivating. Despite concluding and resolving the main emotional throughline of the previous arc, carried over into this one are two very compelling plotlines. Uryu's grappling with his own lack of power and Ichigo being both figuratively and literally consumed by his. Two contrasting characters with two contrasting problems. Having established both of these worries and stressors in the prior arc, having delivered the required closure in the prior arc also, now we get to to experience and explore the ramifications of these two lines of narrative. Two lines of narrative that complement each other rather brilliantly, might I add. The first set piece or conflict that takes place in this arc occurs when three different entities attack three different characters. Though right now, I'd like to discuss Ichigo and Uryu's respective conflicts first. And let me tell you, these are near perfect and provide by far the best intro and hook I've received so far from this story as a reader. So there's this new character in town called Shinji and he looks all sorts of screwed up. And concerning Ichigo's fight, Shinji represents an easy solution to a terrifying problem that seems to be plaguing Ichigo. The fear of losing himself to the darkness inside of him. With every passing day, each passing fight, he feels his grip on the hilt of his sword loosening more and more. Concerned that one day, the powerful entity that dwells within him we saw last time might take control for good. Speaking to the fear that I explored last time, Ichigo is terrified that this darker force inside of him is something he needs to always fight against at every possible moment. An exhausting effort for sure, one that makes what Shinji is offering all the more alluring. With him claiming that Ichigo is fighting against his inherent nature, that his true nature is rejecting his decision to be a soul reaper and that he should join him and become something that he calls a wizard, which just sounds like a German pronouncing the word wizard. And after a quick Google, I now realize Realize that it's called Visard. My mistake. <laughs> you think your current earbuds are powerful? Well, think again. Raycon's everyday earbuds just graduated from the Soul Society and they look, feel, and sound better than ever. And just like a Zanpakuto, these Raycons come in a variety of new forms like this fancy blue one. But they also have a focus on the form of your ear thanks to their optimized gel tips. You can go berserk like Impachi or bouncy like Orihime and these will not budge. They've even got you covered for hours too, thanks to 8 hours of playtime and 32 hours of battery life. That's like 8 hours of canon and 32 hours of filler episodes. It's amazing. They're super customizable too. For example, you can swap between three sound profiles to really tailor the sound to your preference. Pure sound for pristine vocals and podcasts, balanced sound for a one-size-fits-all approach across many genres, or just go wild with a full bass sound to really amplify Bleach's legendary soundtrack. You can also pick noise isolation or awareness mode to decide whether you want to be totally immersed or keep track of what's going on around you. It's as simple as holding the left and right earbud respectively for three seconds to cycle through these modes. They really are pristine and priced perfectly. You get all this fantastic audio quality at half the price of other premium audio brands. And with over 50,000 five-star ratings, it's clearly not just me who thinks so. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com forward slash notmark to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. 
Ichigo obviously refuses because, I mean, look at him. With a character design like that, I can't exactly blame him. Uryu, on the other hand, seems to have the opposite problem, where Ichigo's power seems to be spiraling out of his control as a side effect of his actions in the last arc. Uryu, in this section, seems to be seeing the consequences, his own lack of power, as a choice that he ultimately made in the last arc also. And as he's in the heat of battle, with things not going his way, it's revealed that... The interaction with Uryu's father represents a much more direct approach from one of the two parental figures in this arc, and heck, even this chapter, and I will be getting to that, don't you worry. Unlike Ichigo, who is dealing with a physical issue he's terrified of, Uryu is dealing with a moral dilemma his father proposes. He'll get him his powers back, but on one condition. In return, he must never involve himself with Soul Reapers again. Now, I'm interested to see where this goes, as it can offer Uryu two options. Number one, he betrays his father sooner rather than later and retains the good character development he's received thus far. Or, number two, he undergoes a corruption arc where he reverts back to his classic ways, gaining a lot of power in the process. Think Vegeta during the Buu Saga. And this path is also interesting, offering up another force for Ichigo to fight against and usually results in a magnificent moment of reconciliation at the end. Again, a la Vegeta's sacrifice. And if all of these inversions and contrasts to the specific encounters with Ichigo and Uryu weren't enough to suggest that Uryu's on a complementary or contrasting path to that of Ichigo, Ichigo's father too gets introduced as being someone with much more significant powers than we otherwise thought he did. He's a soul reaper. What the hell is happening? I was gonna say I called it with the talisman his father gave him as a means of protecting him because, I mean, I wasn't wrong about it being what it was, a protection spell sort of thing, but, but I was wrong about his mom being the one with the powers. Still, 50% is a passing grade. And again, in keeping with Ichigo and Uryu's contrasting circumstances, unlike Uryu's father, Ichigo's doesn't appear before his son, but instead in front of the third and final fight that takes place in this arc with Khan. And that one exists entirely for exposition. And to be honest, it's good exposition too. It's exposition that stems from naturally sounding conversations and questions that would be asked by someone like Khan. Questions that led us to answers that explain that this crazy looking creature here is called an Arankar. And by extension, this is what the Ark is named after. Hollows that take their mass off to gain Soul Reaper powers, supposedly. Which, now that I think about it, is sort of the opposite of what Ichigo seems to be doing here with the Visards. A Soul Reaper who puts on a mask to get more powerful. More on that a little later. As mentioned, Shinji seems to be offering Ichigo the chance to take control of his life. However, Ichigo does deny this offer outright before running off to check out a source of another large spiritual pressure. But honestly, this section is filled with so many different things that make me rethink this entire story in Double Take, like Urahara's conversation shortly after with Ichigo's father. I honestly don't fully know what side they are on. Maybe a division of Soul Reaper that exists on Earth to defend it exclusively? Question mark? I don't know. Furthermore, I still feel like there's a massive backstory to Urahara that I still don't really know about. He's a bit of an enigma. Ichigo's father describes the Visors as a lawless gang of ex-Soul Reapers who tried to acquire hollow powers through forbidden methods. However, given that the Soul Society seemed to have issues too, it's hard to say cut and dry whose assessment of who is correct here, or more specifically, who we should believe. Naturally, I think the answer lies somewhere in the middle, but I do enjoy that we seem to be getting this biased interpretation from various groups in the the story. It helps it feel much more lively and nuanced. However, there is something to take note of with this specific interaction. Despite being able to dispose of this Arankar in spectacular fashion, this one is far more developed and powerful than all the others he's ever faced. He suspects Aizen is behind it, thinking he made a deal with the Arankars so that they can help him achieve his goal, whatever that might be, we still don't know at this point. Meanwhile, Chad and Orihime confront this newly introduced character, Hiyori, and of course, Shinji we are all familiar with. Uryu makes a promise to his father in exchange for his powers back, and so with that, it seems that all the pieces are in place for the next large-scale set of plot beats, which I will be breaking down into segments, the first of which being... <laughs> The Arankar duo versus the forces of Earth. 
This is really cool, but for a bunch of different reasons. Okay, as Ichigo's father pointed out moments ago, while they might suspect Aizen to be behind this, we still aren't certain and furthermore don't even know what he plans to do. If this was all there was to the plot, then I would be singing a very different tune to the predominantly positive one I am right now. Thankfully, the way Kubo has orchestrated and structured this arc serves the slow burn and adds an air of mysterious terror to these monsters that honestly up until now have escaped your understanding. As an emotional through line, we are focused on Ichigo's inner struggle and as it happens, instances like these are what directly put pressure and emphasis on that struggle. So by virtue of these characters existing in the story, we get an interesting dynamic where as an audience, we are satisfied by the direct impact these newly introduced characters have on the main source of interest, Ichigo and the gang, all the while keeping us receptive to what they have to say, which as we soon find out, exposits the true nature of this broader story. So let's take a closer look. The sudden arrival of these two grabs the attention of and sends shockwaves through all the major cast and me as an audience member. Two Arankars have arrived on the scene. Their names I will not even attempt to try at this point, particularly the little guy. I just don't trust myself with that sort of responsibility. But for now, I shall refer to them as Vegeta and Nappa, seeing as their sudden appearance both in Arrival, Reveal, and subsequent action with the big guy killing a bunch of folks look a whole lot like when Vegeta and Nappa first touched down on Earth in Dragon Ball Z, all the way down to the framing of the scene. And what sets these two apart Apart from the creature Ichigo's father contended with earlier is that they are fully developed. Jesus Christ, Chad. Is he dead? And holy shit, Orihime is a beast, saving Chad and managing to block an attack like that from this person. I'm not even kind of kidding here. Orihime has gone from a character that pushed me away, quite literally, from the series when I was watching the anime all that time ago, to one of my favorite female characters out of all the big three. This is an incredibly tense scene with us potentially on the verge of losing two important and lovable characters. Punk. Oh, thank God. Okay, and this is where the dynamic I love about this arc makes itself known. These two put Ichigo in a bad position, but one he's able to comfortably fight against until suddenly he starts to struggle and lose the battle in his mind. The depiction of this in the manga is pretty cool too, through the blacking out of panels, as if to suggest the dark is both figuratively taking over Ichigo's point of view and literally our pages in this manga. This issue is becoming so serious for Ichigo that it literally now means that even with enemies, he should have no problem with, he is struggling and in this case almost died. Which not only would have spelt the end for him, but as we've seen, those he too was defending in Chad and Orihime. Looking over her in bed, recovering now from that very incident, covered in bandages, Ichigo says, Chad got mangled. Tatsuki was almost killed. All because I was too weak. So that's one problem. The other problem, well, comes by way of these two tactically retreating and passing on this message to Aizen. Shut up, Mimsy! Who shares with us part, at least, of his plan. This acts as an easy way to once again exposit more about where Arankers come from, how they begin as Menos, and how, depending on the type of Menos they start off as, how that will dictate what sort of level the Arankar that emerges will be. Gillians make for the weakest Arankars, Ajukas come in the middle of the pack, and Vasto Lowerdes making for the elite soldier types. But you don't want to be elite, because elite's got no integrity. The strength of which are entirely unknown to us at this point. What we do know, however, is that Aizen plans on making more. And this is where things start to get really, really good. The plot starts to settle down and we get into the main body of this arc. Following this occurrence, a bunch of familiar faces from the Soul Society show up at Ichigo's school. Rukia is among them and it's a great reveal. Rukia manages to remind Ichigo of who he is, who she recognizes him as. He needs to become stronger to protect those that need to be protected. But first, we have something much more interesting to contend with. Grim Jow's Invasion. This is the first proper invasion of the arc and our first true glimpse at what this story has in store for us. And let me tell you, it's pretty awesome. And partially what makes this invasion interesting is that Grim Jow went behind Aizen's back to take out the folks he thought the other two failed to kill. And the stuff that spawns from this is brilliant. Now, 
Obviously, there's Grim Joe's fight with uh, Ichigo that acts as the centerpiece and justifiably so. However, there are a few other fights that occur with the various Soul Society members after descending from on high. And by far, the best battle that came courtesy of these folks, and maybe even this section, has to be the one with Ikaku. Set up as him looking for a place to crash, the tough guy lacks attitude that this guy has is infectious and that honestly surprised me. In the previous arc, I genuinely thought that he was sort of a joke with his talk of luck and the quick fashion with which Ichigo did away with him in the end. He seemed to me at the time like a gimmick character. But I was wrong. <laughs> Ikaku versus Edorad. Grim Joe, having arrived with a hit squad of five other individuals, one of them makes their way towards Ikaku, aiming to kill everyone with a spiritual pressure. And I think I fell in love with Ikaku during this fight. Fighting this guy in the name of finding a place to crash for the night, it starts out charming and fun with Ikaku looking both formidable and kinda dope, not gonna lie. But when the Aranker awakens his blade, things quickly change. And as things often do in Bleach, the fight gets turned on its head with the good guy character who was once dominating, finding himself in a dicey situation. Get it? Dicey? Because swords? <laughs> and funnily enough, things are going so badly for this dude that this ally of his even sends word to organize a funeral for him. But thankfully, Ikaku has another ace up his sleeve. <laughs> This looks sick, and furthermore, Ikaku comes across as massively impressive and tenacious from this point on. And with his Bankai being a slow starter, the longer the fight goes on, the more powerful it ultimately stands to become. Foreshadowing, maybe? Question mark? I don't know. His big attack, however, doesn't work, and the battle just sort of ends without him dying. There's a message here about valuing life over honor, and I think it's a great theme these types of manga don't often push, but the ending did feel pretty lackluster compared to the rest of it, particularly after we find out they're all basically nerfed and Ikaku is the only one of them outside of Rukia who didn't... Yeah, who didn't get to show us what he's really made of. So hopefully there's more to come from this guy later on in the arc. Matsumoto, Renji, and Toshiro versus whoever they're fighting. This fight is probably the most busy, it involves three people and largely is there to deliver one epic moment and a whole bunch of necessary information. They all win and defeat their respective Arankers, but it was the announcement that these guys get to use their full power on Earth that took the hype level, for me, to the max. It's such a great callback to the first arc, and truth be told, I had completely forgotten about that mechanic, and it really surprised me. The main takeaway from the exposition, however, that I could glean, was that the main guys we have to look out for are numbered from 10 to 1, 10 being the weakest, 1 being the strongest. And of the main 10, apparently, at this moment, Grim Jow is number 6. Ooh, the plot thickens. Grim Jow versus Ichigo. Grim Jow is a cool name to see written down. Grim Jow has a really cool design. Grim Jow is really strong. Grim Jow is one of the Vasto Lordes. And Chad is isolated, but thankfully it's not Grim Jow that finds him initially, but another of these rankers called D Roy. Meaning Ichigo and Rukia need to make their way towards him to make the save. And you know, this is sort of an aside to this whole fight with Ichigo and Grimjow, but watching as Chad realizes how useless and helpless he is now kind of feels awful. The once enormously powerful Chad now is reduced to nothing but an inconvenience for Ichigo to have to protect, helpless to do anything. It's at this moment in time I realize that I haven't actually seen Rukia fight as a Soul Reaper since the very first chapter of the series, and I think to myself, that can't be right, so if I am mistaking, please point it out in the comments, because that's crazy. She sees Ichigo as being emotionally compromised, and so takes on the big boy herself, and she is awesome. There are numerous instances where Rukia's Soul Reaper blade is described in detail during this section also, with specific emphasis put on how white the blade is. It's a blink and you miss it sort of description, but my obsessive brain feels like there might be something to that very description. So here's my artistic theory. In this instance, I think it's possible that Kubo, the artiste, has chosen to use her white blade to symbolize a thematic opposite or complement to Ichigo's black blade. A yin to his yang, so to speak. 
And now that I think about it, both of these characters seem to be capable of bringing balance to their respective lives. Her managing to ease Ichigo's mind when he's troubled, and he, in the past, has, in his own way, brought balance to her life by preserving it, and not to mention giving her a friend group. So, now that I think about it, maybe these two are special or destined to be partners. Or maybe I'm talking out my ass. Only time will tell, I guess. So yeah, this happens. Damn. Okay. Ichigo gives everything he has in Bankai form to Grim Jiao and still nothing. Grim Jiao in this instance is effectively the wall Ichigo has to overcome in this arc, or at least shows us how much farther he needs to be able to go. And what's interesting in this case is that this wall is both physical in terms of the strength gap between these two, but also highlights the psychological issues Ichigo is having currently. All the way through this fight, I was waiting for something Ichigo could do to tear down Grim Jiao, and at one point I was sort of waiting for Rukia to wake up and get the power boost from the others. But in the end, she was too busy being almost dead. Ichigo, in this instance, is very clearly fighting himself as well as his opponent, and if it wasn't for Tozen, who arrives at the last moment to reprimand Grimjo for invading without permission, Ichigo and maybe everyone else could conceivably have all died. But alas, he survives to tell the tale, but loses the battle to Grimjo emphatically. I guess we have a short-term goal to shoot for now, in addition to dealing with Ichigo's performance issues. Licking their wounds, following this attack, everyone is forced to seek out their own training. Ichigo solicits the help of the Vizards he once turned down. Which brings us to what seems to be a necessary part of every Bleach arc, training. Alright, so there's this moment that occurs once Ichigo gets to the Visard base of operations and I'm pretty sure you all know what I'm talking about. It's really intense and to be honest, it gave me chills while I was reading it. Partially because of the artwork, partially because of the implications that stem from it, but mostly due to how Kubo himself set this very specific instance up to land as powerfully as it did in the manga. So, what am I talking about exactly? Well, in order to gain control over the hollow inside of him trying to take over, Ichigo must first convince those in Shinji's company that he is worth their effort to train in the first place. Hiyori specifically takes Ichigo to task and goats him into this confrontation. She assumes her hollow form and beats Ichigo into kingdom come. Terrified to embrace or even contend with what lurks within him, Ichigo refuses to engage at all with what Hiyori is demanding of him. But she does force the hollow out. This look of genuine shock and trauma on Hiyori's face sent shivers down my spine. Now, I do not know what this was depicted or built up like in the anime, but in the manga it was spectacular. As I mentioned before, Hiyori was introduced alongside Shinji during one of his confrontations with Ichigo back in chapter 189. What I suspect was communicated in the anime was her boisterous, domineering, and unflinching demeanor through voice acting and clever implementation of sound effects and animation. However, in the manga, this I think is magnified in its own unique ways. Naturally, her speech bubbles supersede his in pretty much every instance she chooses to have her voice heard. However, above all else, it was how she dominated the panel space within the different layouts and pages that visually communicated her personality from the moment we saw her. In her literal introductory page, her character appears as though she is standing on Shinji's cowering face. Let that sink in. Her body extending beyond the parameters of her panel and into Shinji's. This is brilliant, subtle, and honestly, fun visual storytelling. This isn't a girl to be messed with, and certainly not one that scares easily. However, when face to face with the terror of Ichigo's darker half, her disposition changes starkly, enhancing the scene all the more, with the split second he had her by the throat and the reaction from her friends showing us all we needed to know concerning how serious that instance in time truly was. And what follows this is effectively a confirmation of what I anticipated this story to be about, one where Ichigo learns to live with an aspect of who he is and refuses to allow that aspect he's terrified of to consume him and determine what he is. You could look at this as a metaphor for confronting your problems, not allowing the act of avoiding them to send you spiraling and to dictate to yourself who you really are rather than be ruled by the risk of losing yourself by what you dislike about yourself. It's also a scene where we get to meet a load of Shinji and Hiyori's allies. They are fun, silly, and I just love it when Kubo adds some fun new characters to the mix. But I digress. The premise for this is simple, and how it's visually explored is fun to watch also. Essentially, Ichigo gets to fight himself in his own mind, all the while the state of the fight itself is being depicted outwardly in Ichigo's body as he slowly and then quickly becomes literally consumed by the hollow he's 
fighting within. It's really cool to look at and particularly when the monster starts to lose limbs only to regenerate them instantly. And to be honest, it looks kind of sick, I'm not gonna lie. There's a wonderful framework for the fight that keeps this both consistent and straightforward to follow. Hollow Ichigo consistently refers to himself as Zangetsu, implying beyond the obvious that he is in fact his weapon. And like any great weapon, it needs a wielder worthy of its potential. Furthermore, after addressing Ichigo as king right off the bat when he arrives, I enjoyed the metaphor that was being drawn of the difference between a horse and the king that rides the horse into battle. Naturally, Ichigo's darker half believes that the right course of action is bloody murder left, right, and center, and there are some wonderful quotes from this section too. How can you slay with a sheathed sword? Speaking to the failure of Ichigo's very logic. However, the important thing to learn here isn't to fully embrace and give control to Hollow Ichigo, because the opposite of that isn't very good either, but to instead use the power in a controlled and effective way. Because if he doesn't, he becomes as useless as a sheath sword as he mentioned. And it seems that Ichigo gets that message, at least partially. Grabbing the sword and embedded in his abdomen, pulling it from the grasp of his hollow form, visually saying that he is once again taking control, taking the reins of this altercation, punctuated by him taking out his hollow counterpart with one powerful thrust of his sword. His black color once again dominating his form, reclaiming the blade used against him, Ichigo emerges victorious. However, something that I will keep in mind is that this isn't over. While Ichigo has won this particular battle, he has not yet learned the life-changing lesson that will win him the war within. As Hollow Ichigo reminds him before vanishing into his subconscious, So while this bodes well for Ichigo in the short term, I wonder how long he has until he finds himself on his knees, looking deep within, asking himself how badly he wants to win again. I was recently told that when devising a name for this story, Tight Kubo noted that while Shinigami are associated with Black, Black itself would be a boring name for the series. White suggested Black as a complementary color, and he therefore chose Bleach to evoke the impression of the color white. These colors, black and white, seem to be intertwined with the DNA of this story, both narratively and visually. There are a lot of things this story could, in its essence, be about, but in my opinion, it is specifically about the struggle Ichigo's inner conflict represents. The fascination Kubo has with the contrast white evokes onto black speaks to this very direction. It's emblematic of and draws attention to the central conflict of this long series, light versus dark, suggesting not that one is superior to the other, but that one needs both to achieve balance. Chapter 219, page 6 and 7 demonstrate this very conflict visually. And it's not until one side succumbs to the other that this contrast and conflict on the page layout stops, and the two colors representing Ichigo merge into one seen on the hilt of this sword in chapter 221. Returning to the land of the living with a mask now, one side emboldened and marked with black, and the other side clear and white, signifying that when apart they are hollow, and that only when working together are they truly whole. And this very aspect is something that is drawn attention to when Orihime sees him for the very first time after this reconciliation of the two halves. Ichigo's getting really strong, and not in a scary way like before, but it's not in a nice way either, suggesting perhaps that he has found a balance, a mix of both. And this is where the main conflict that informs the rest of the arc comes in. Now that Ichigo is no longer fighting with himself, at least for the time being, he has regained his ability to be useful, to save lives, to protect his allies and town from the coming conflict as Aizen readies to destroy his home and gather 100,000 souls. He has friends that are willing to, much like him, give up their lives in an effort to defend those that need defending, and given that he is the one with the most power potential, that responsibility as a protector lands on his shoulders. Conversely, Orihime, Chad, and Uryu's training has a light shone on it for the first time during this period too. However, Orihime gets far more attention and honestly, I think rightfully so. Towards the beginning of this arc, a greater emphasis was placed on Uryu's journey and choice he needed to make, but in reality has gotten very little focus since, with a tremendous amount of the emphasis placed on introducing new character systems and mechanics. And while I think this is rightfully done, as it is important for us to understand what's going on moving forward, I'm happy that at the very least, the likes of Uryu, Chad, and especially Orihime have an opportunity to express their frustrations, 
wants and goals in this portion. There's a fantastic moment towards the beginning of Grim Zhao's first invasion where Chad is shown to be defenseless and unable to help Ichigo in his fight. For the very first time, he has become the person who was helpless and powerless, a burden in the way. And I hope more of this aspect of Chad's character is explored in the future as he trains relentlessly. The philosophy his very character represented in the first arc was profound, but was spoken to from the point of view of someone that was powerful knowing what to do with that power. However, now we get to see him vulnerable. The powerful has become the weak and so I'm interested to see how he reacts to this new status quo shift. Will he thrive or just expire and lose relevancy? Only time I guess will tell. But for me it was Orihime's participation in this arc that has once again been the highlight. As I mentioned moments ago, Kubo has gone to a tremendous amount of effort to have this be a story concerning Ichigo but more accurately and generally the struggle in one's heart to be the best that they can be. With the differences that emerge between the host of different characters that populate this manga showcasing that for us specifically. Orihime is terrific for this very reason, sharing in her own personal struggle in trying to desperately not be a burden, which like Chad, also harkens back to her struggle in the first arc with her brother. All the while in this arc acting as a character with enough emotional maturity to point out for us clear examples of her friends changing for the bad and for the good. I mentioned that she noticed when Ichigo seemed to find balance within himself being a force to be reckoned with, but that quote and that scene really only works in the first place because of what we've heard her say in the past. She's pointed out when Khan was in Ichigo's body that that wasn't Ichigo. She's always picked up on when Ichigo himself is feeling off and earlier in this very arc, in order to create the appropriate contrast for when Ichigo eventually achieves balance, she points out in chapter 193 on page 7 that while in his Bankai form, Ichigo feels different. Fiercer, grittier, like it's not even him anymore while he's at war with himself. I adore stuff like this and Orihime's story is being fully embraced and explored. We've seen her insecurities following her inability to pick up Ichigo when he was down and we've seen her jealousy when it comes to how successful Rukia has become in doing just that. Being unlike Ichigo who seems to constantly struggle with finding his inner balance, Orihime hasn't yet fallen or allowed those weaker and darker feelings she's had impede her ability to see reality. Well, that was until she straight up was told to her face that she isn't enough and should take a backseat courtesy of Mr. Kisuke. Following this news, she's picked up by the person she envied in Rukia. And because she never burned that very bridge, Rukia was able to pick her up in the same way she was able to help Ichigo. It's a wonderful and engaging dynamic these characters share, reinforcing once again that Bleach's strongest attribute, at least to me, is in its character writing. With everyone having trained for the last month, this is about where the first arc of this much longer Arankar arc or saga comes to its final big set piece. And with this conclusion comes a refocusing on a particular character with the story going in a much needed new direction. I could feel this shift coming on the horizon and the best part was, I had no idea where it was coming from and more importantly, where it would go. And I thought the results, while not perfect, was an interesting decision to say the least. So. Let's talk about the fights in this invasion and more specifically, what they actually came here for in the first place. Grim Zhao vs Ichigo, take two electric boogaloo. I think one of the best decisions this arc made was to introduce Grim Zhao as this chaotic and unpredictable character. Thanks to him, as an audience, there is this air of uncertainty as we're reading while he's on screen. We don't know what they are here for just yet, but we suspect Grim Zhao could be acting on his own or going off script at any moment. Unlike Ichigo, who's a great reactionary character, Grim Zhao is a fantastic foil to create that plot for Ichigo to ultimately react to. And so this fight, at least while I was reading it, got the majority of my my focus, which I can only imagine was the best case scenario for Kubo in aiding in what he ultimately wants to achieve with this part, a misdirection. And let me tell you, it totally got me. But concerning the fight itself, there are a few noteworthy additions and changes to the status quo to justify this rematch and very much inject interest. Grim Zhao is weakened and Ichigo has a cool new party trick, a party trick that functions in the same way as my favorite move from Dragon Ball does. The Kaioken. Kaio what? Much like the Kaioken, this holification offers Ichigo the chance to boost his speed and power tremendously. However, only for a short amount of time and with a great cost or risk to himself. 
if he exceeds that time window, well, bad stuff can happen. And because of this, apart from looking cool in every sense of the word, it also brings with it a new level of tension to the fight. We wait for Ichigo to use it, we anticipate how his foe will react and deal with this new power, and we worry every single moment he uses it because, as of right now, he can only use it for like 11 seconds, which is an hilariously short amount of time for a power boost in a fight. I might even go as far as to say that it offers something more than Kaioken does in Dragon Ball and therefore might be more interesting to me. Because there is that added fear of not just physical overexertion, but the collapse of Ichigo's mind too. It's a brilliant ruffle to this already engaging and fun moveset Ichigo has at his disposal. <laughs> The initial attack Ichigo lands is stunning, and seeing Grimjo scared after being so cocky is honestly thrilling. Ichigo utterly obliterates him in one attack, leaving Grimjo stunned and confused by the difference Ichigo is demonstrating in his ability. The fight continues for a few moments with Ichigo landing another big attack, but his mask crumbles, and he's out of time. Switching gears for a second, and I will go back to this, don't worry. We check out what's going on at the same time with Toshiro Ikaku this guy. and Matsumoto with their arankers. <laughs> Urahara shows up to fight. Never in my life have I needed something so much and never known until I received it. Realizing that this was one of, if not the only time I had seen Urahara fight properly made it all the more compelling as it told us possibly quite a bit about his character. Arriving in time to make the save on Matsumoto, throughout this battle he uses many different interesting tactic based approaches not limited to a decoy gigai proving himself to be a very analytical fighter, much more brains than brawn, though not lacking in either department really. It very much paints him as a thinking man soul reaper, which is a nice change of pace and an interesting fighting style, in keeping with what little I know already about Urahara as of right now. Alright, so that's that fight. How are things going with Ichigo again? <laughs> Uh, not good. Oh shit! Don't lose your way. Yes! 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 After leaving Urahime to take the long way home from Soul Society, Rukia arrives just in the nick of time to block a devastating attack from Grimjow onto Ichigo, one that would have surely been his end. With Grimjow now frozen, Rukia moves to check on Ichigo, but gets grabbed by Grimjow, and then... Don't lose your way. Holy shit again! Shinji saves the day! This was brilliant to sit and read through. He even fires his own several blasts at him, which is really cool that he uses hollow base moves. It's just something that I don't really see that often. Nevertheless, Grimjo blocks it at the last possible moment before being stopped in his tracks by Ulkiora, who quietly informs him that apparently the mission has already been accomplished. Orihime has been secured. She was the target. I did not see that coming. And neither did Ichigo and thus sets up the next arc's goal. And it's a goal I can 1000% get behind because, as I said, I love her character. And what follows this is perhaps the best Orihime chapter of all time, or at least thus far in the series. But before I get into that, I'd like to touch on one aspect of this saga, or arc if you want to call it that, that I didn't like. It was a choice that was instrumental in creating these circumstances that, while good, came about in a sort of strange way. And it's all because of a really dumb decision Urahara made. As someone that's depicted as this analytical and strategic individual, his reasoning for pushing Orihime away like he did to stay out of the battle seems so incredibly short-sighted and irresponsible. If he knew or suspected they would come for her, why not guard her? Why not tell her? Why leave her defenseless? This is what I personally don't like in stories. Kubo clearly needed Orihime to get captured in private by this specific individual. And in order to achieve that, Kubo decided to compromise a specific character's integrity. It's not a decision I can get behind personally, so let's just move on. Orihime's goodbye. Unlike other arcs, this one concludes on a very somber note. 
offering not Ichigo, but instead Orihime the spotlight. A private moment of introspection and vulnerability no other character has shared with us thus far in this series. It's moments like this I adore when a story takes the time to explore and bask in a specific character's mental space. After being given this bracelet that wraps her in a special spiritual membrane, she has 12 hours to say her goodbyes to one person and one person only. They won't be able to hear or perceive her, but she does choose one person, and it's Ichigo. Her goodbye to the man she loves is the sweetest chapter this manga has delivered, and the care Kubo places on the smallest of movements is truly touching, illuminating for us, as Ichigo rests, the world Orihime dreams of. One where she could be all the different things she loves and is interested in. She is, after all, a very sporadic and eclectic character. However, no matter how many interests she might have, no matter how many foods she might like or jobs she might conceivably try in her lifetime, no matter how many versions of her might be possible, she admits that they would all fall in love with Ichigo. And that right there, that not only is a beautifully sweet sentiment, but is one as true to her as any other piece of dialogue that has ever been written by Kubo for her. And it's, I think, one of the strongest examples of character writing in this entire series. It's truly a fantastic scene and a brilliant chapter. Interesting, however, yet another example of good exposition. Despite being in some sort of astral form that's supposedly imperceptible, she manages to heal him before she goes, leaving behind her unique spiritual pressure and ultimately providing a brilliant way of sending a signal without breaking the claws of what her bracelet represents. Which brings us to the end of this arc. With Orohime in the clutches of Aizen and our heroes readying themselves for an adventure to a dangerous land unlike any that we've yet come across in this story, I do have some concerns. While I am invested in Orohime's story and her relationship with her friends, particularly Ichigo, I am also aware that this is a very similar setup to that of the Soul Society arc. So from this point on, I'm curious to see what Kubo can offer in the way of differentiating or adding variety to the mix in this situation, as this does have a few important differences to the Soul Society to play with, not the least of which is the character of Aizen having been established as well as these new creatures. But only time will tell, and for you all watching, you don't have to wait to see my thoughts on this like I did, because this is a special two-part video, so let's dive straight into the next arc of this saga without delay. I want to say from the outset before diving into this section that if my opinions don't line up with your own, it should go without saying that I'm not trying to invalidate your experience. Many of you watching have either exclusively watched the anime, which I haven't, and or have read the manga while it was coming out weekly, which I didn't. This arc has a lot, and I mean a lot of fighting, so when it comes to the pacing reading week to week, I can totally imagine a world where that would have been irritating for some readers out there. However, my experience binging the whole thing this week has been massively positive, so I figured before we venture forth into the void beyond of Hueco Mundo, that was worth addressing. Now, one of the biggest criticisms of this arc is that it feels too much like the Soul Society, and having read over 60 chapters of this arc now, I can see where that criticism is coming from, and it isn't entirely unfounded. Structurally, there are a lot of similarities, and if you really want to strip it down to its bare components, it is a chunk of story contending with freeing one of their female friends from captivity after they willfully go there in an effort to protect their friends from danger. That is unavoidably true, however I think suggesting that it is a carbon copy of the previous arc with nothing new to offer is going entirely too far. While it is important to accept the similarities, I think it's critical if we want to be balanced and fair to also take note of what this particular story is trying to achieve because it's quite quite a bit different to Soul Society in some important ways. First of all, in a similar fashion to that of the Substitute Shinigami arc, it's impossible to divorce the significance of what that first invasion or first part of this greater arc or saga did in order to lead into this particular section. While the driving force of Soul Society was to, broadly speaking, shine a light on Ichigo's personal development and Rukia's interpersonal development, through he having to learn to trust himself and Rukia learning to see herself as someone worth the time of of day, the Arankar arc clearly has its own unique story it wants to tell that continues the journeys explored through the likes of Substitute Shinigami and Soul Society respectively. In other words, 
they are similar in structure, but totally different in what they're trying to achieve. And I think that's important. How Ichigo performs and develops in this arc is a direct evolution from Soul Society. It's part of his journey. And having now completed that last arc, his exploits in that very story have led him to making some fundamental errors in the opposite direction with this one, where he himself wishes now to take on all the responsibility, denying his friends the chance to contribute to the greater mission and give it a greater chance of success. So in a way, Ichigo's story in this arc not only is different to Soul Society, but it's the exact opposite. It focuses on what is outwardly happening and concerning Ichigo rather than solely what is inside him. And it does show through the fights that this story offers also. Could this story have been told in a different way with a different structure to that of Soul Society? Yeah, probably, but it didn't detract at all from what I like about this arc because, as I've outlined right now, this is only the midsection of this greater Arankar arc and it goes in a very different direction, all things considered. Which is the most important thing for me, but enough preamble, what did I think of this arc's events? So Ichigo arrives at Mr. Urahara's place and hops into the void beyond, reluctantly with the help of Chad and Uryu who justify to him to go on this mission because Ichigo is technically going against the orders of the Soul Society. Uh, it's a tenuous at best excuse that his dad almost certainly won't buy, but it is still technically correct. Which, as we all know, is the best kind of correct. There's some interesting seeds set also with the likes of Tatsuki that I assume will be addressed when they return in the next section of the story. And following that, we get some really interesting insight into how important Orihime might actually become to not only this story, but Ichigo specifically and his journey. I'm about to share a prediction, a theory if you will, so put your tinfoil hats on. We learn that Orihime is effectively this miracle healer, so much so that she can restore individuals' bodies to a point where they once were perfectly fine. It's sort of like rebooting to previous save files. It's nuts. Grimjow lost his arm earlier in the story, but now he has it back. So this is where my theory comes in. The theme and, well, really the soft goal of this greater arc is to explore the importance of trust and teamwork for Ichigo. To fight against shouldering the weight of the world alone when others can help. For when Ichigo does shoulder the world's problems, he runs the risk of losing himself to the hollow inside of him. It's a cool consequence of him overexerting himself that I know will eventually happen later on in the story, it just has to. So what if when he does, what if he does lose himself and can't bring himself back from the brink until Orihime steps in? What if her powers grant her the ability to do just that? That would keep her as the focus of the story while also playing into the theme of trust and teamwork being a necessary part of what Ichigo should learn to appreciate. The weakest in terms of battle now suddenly becomes the most crucial component of making Ichigo, one of the most powerful, live up to his potential. Now, this is just a theory, but I think it's a good one. I'm sure if nothing else, she'll be healing him sporadically throughout this journey, which again reinforces the themes anyways. Oh, and before moving on, there's this conversation with the two dads of Ichigo and Uryu that doesn't manifest in anything meaningful within this section, so I'll hold off on discussing that until it does become relevant. The Arrival the initial landing in the land of the Arankars, Hueco Mundo, is pretty cool. There's a decent amount of variety in the environment from scene to scene, whether it be battles in the desert, run-ins in a castle-like structure, or just voids of darkness with the likes of Aizen and a certain other Cayenne character. And with that variety comes Uru and Chad's chance to demonstrate how capable they truly have become, by kicking the asses of these lowly Arankars, I guess. It's great that we're reinforcing the themes of this story right off the bat, and we get an idea of what awaits them on this journey. There's also a nice touch with Uru's character that's drawn attention to early on, as he's able to absorb and become empowered by the Reishi in the atmosphere of this place, thus boosting his powers. However, while this is cool and leads to some cool moments for him specifically, there isn't much relevance to this Reishi being in the atmosphere beyond the power boost for him specifically. It doesn't facilitate any narrative switch if that makes sense, at least not yet that I've read anyway. It did, however, bring to my attention that Rukia might be an anomaly when it comes to regaining her powers through Reishi, seeing as Ichigo can seem to absorb it for his benefit like Uryu can. This is Nell, and this is when we meet Nell and her friends. And when I first met them, I thought they were fine, albeit a little cumbersome. I did figure that they were going to be our exposition sidekick type characters, for lack of a better term, in this journey. But I was wrong. Really wrong. Nell is awesome, but for now, they need saving. Do 
Rukia. Okay, Rukia is here. That is cool. Now we have another person for Ichigo to be okay with working alongside. This is great, but this is also the point where we arrive at a crossroads, so to speak, with multiple passageways open to explore. And Rukia suggests to split up. Now, personally, I've always been with Shaggy on this one. Splitting up, looking for clues, opens the gang up to all sorts of mayhem, and while good for the purposes of Scooby-Doo and apparently this arc for tension, I don't think it's unreasonable for Ichigo to say that this might be a bad idea. There are better ways to communicate his urge to push away from accepting help than by trusting his friends to isolate themselves in the most dangerous place that currently exists in this world. But whatever, I guess we're splitting up. Ichigo's first encounter on this path of his is quite tough. He's forced to turn into his hollow form again for like a second, and the fight is weirdly long, but honestly, I'm not sure exactly why it is. I want to talk about this arc's action and sheer quantity of its fighting, but again, I have that saved for later in this video, so look forward to that. From what I can gather, there's some reinforcement of themes in this fight, as well as demonstrating to us that Nell is something special, something much more important than this impish character she seems to be showing. Because in addition to this crazy Kero or Cero Blast, she also has healing capabilities. <gasps> While I haven't dedicated much time of this review to touch on what Uryu has been doing, I do want to show some appreciation to this new dynamic made between this Aranker companion of Nels, who's acting as the funny man, to Uryu's straight man. I don't know how this translates in the anime, but in the manga, it's pretty inoffensive and it got a giggle out of me here and there. That aside, what I do think is worth mentioning, however, is the conclusion to the fight he has with this random bugger anchor that's number 105. He whips out this new move and does away with her relatively easily, all things considered. Similarly to Ichigo, Uryu didn't want to use his ace in the hole just yet. However, unlike Ichigo, which saw him and Nell show mercy, Uryu didn't, leaving their victims there helpless. It isn't mentioned again in this section, but I think it is a good contrast that was made between these two that is obviously showcased by its placing in the story. But enough about that. Let's talk about Chad. What did I think of his contribution to this section? Well, not a lot. <laughs> because Chad doesn't get a lot in this section, if I'm being honest, but he did get a pretty sweet new shield to attach to his arm. Who'd have known that was hiding in there? Okay, jokes aside, it's cool that in keeping with his philosophy that he isn't an attacker, but a defender, the guy grew his shield to protect people. And what's more is he even unlocks his other arm in an offensive measure. He is neither Soul Reaper nor Quincy, he says, but a human channeling hollow powers. And so I guess we have the trifecta, a Quincy, a hollow, and a Soul Reaper. However, following that, he runs into this Aranker and promptly goes to sleep for the rest of this video. Thanks for coming, Chad. You're a real hero. It is cool though getting to see everyone remark on the sudden loss of his spiritual pressure, including Orihime, that does put a lot of pressure on her once again. However, thankfully, following this, we get a much more interesting scene. Rukia versus her demons. This one is really creepy and in ways felt way too real? Like, this scene legit fooled me and still kinda has me fooled? I don't know. So, while hurrying to Chad's location to help him, Rukia gets blindsided by some arancar that knocks her into the shadows. The perfect dark environment to tackle this subject matter, might I add, because it's revealed that this is Kayan. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, what? He explains how he got there and that he has a plan, but Right at the end, when he has her trust, he just straight up attacks her. She just about manages to dodge this, but this just gave me chills while reading. I've touched on this in other videos, but there's a technique in writing called dramatic irony, and it's used when we as an audience know more than the characters in the scene do. It's a common technique, it's really effective, it's popular in pantomime with people shouting to the poor actors on stage that the bad guy is behind them or whatever, you know? It's good for building tension, but this scene decides to do the exact opposite and keep us just as unsure as Rukia is. And man, is it creepy and brilliant all at the same time. The following chapter is filled with manipulation that feels wrong and yet flirts with being strangely believable too. It's wonderful and ends with Rukia demanding that whoever this is to never say Cayenne's name again. 
Watching this Arankar at will explain their powers and transform back into Kayan is terrifying and depicted quite unsettlingly too by Kubo, might I add. I think the fact that they try so earnestly to convince her that they are in fact Kayan time and again is the most unsettling aspect of it. They consume dead hollows and take their powers and this is great but it does remind me of what I want to talk about and that's the fights in this arc and some of the ones that I've glossed over. I want to explain why I've done this so here it goes. Bleach's Battles. In the interest of being fair, because this review is largely very positive, I think it's also important to draw attention to this arc's and perhaps Bleach's weakest aspect that I've noticed thus far, one that is such for many of the series' detractors, and that is the repetitive, cyclical, and perhaps formulaic nature of many of its fight scenes. One of the few parameters of a story I am privy to before I begin my blind read-throughs like this is the length of the material. And one of the concerns I had going into this when I noticed its length was how it was going to use those fights to create interest in that time frame. Brevity for me is a virtue in a story, so when I see a lot of chapters, I hope for its sake that it makes use of that time rather than just bloat itself. For Bleach, like many other shonen stories, fighting is the language of its narrative and story. Characters progress through difficult mental blocks, compromising circumstances, and come out on top or fail in order to propel the story forth into the next story beat. This is important, I love it, and particularly for the likes of Ichigo, his entire story is centered around the defense of his friends from danger through fighting. Where my gripes, however, stem from in this case is through the lack of variety when it comes to many of the fight structure that don't involve Ichigo, the main character specifically. Or heck, sometimes even those that do. The Soul Society and this Hueco Mundo section provide a lot of this, particularly with its secondary characters. Where a good guy and bad guy confront each other, there's sometimes a back and forth, one of them reveals a big power boost, and the other guy looks concerned only to then reveal that he too has a big power move, leading to that person either picking up the victory or someone else coming in to make the save last minute if that person is on the back foot and is a good guy. There are plenty of repetitive scenes that follow this structure and when it came to Soul Society I found this all the more irritating because, at the time, Kubo struggled to keep the secondary cast like Orihime, Chad and Uryu relevant contributing members of the story. And as I mentioned, because the story of this manga is told through fighting, if their fights don't contribute to the story then it feels very much like bloat or filler. And while that didn't bother me all that much while I was reading it all in one go, I can absolutely empathize with someone who read this as a weekly release. It's an entirely different set of circumstances compared to what I have at my disposal right now. However, and this is a big however, I will say that because Bleed structures its fights this way, Kubo actually managed to deliver a genuinely impactful surprise to me, and it was through Rukia's fight with this imposter Kayan. As I mentioned, when it feels like a particular outcome is built up to, it's normally superseded by a, quote, unlikely save at the last minute. This of course creates the problem that when something unlikely happens all the time, then it becomes likely and worse again predictable. However, during this build-up to Rukia's spirit being broken and this fake Kayan lining up his final shot to take her out, because the good versus evil dynamic was so well defined, because it felt like Kuba was writing her to feel broken, because of what I had experienced in this story all the way leading up to this, when Kubo actually followed through with it and showed Rukia legitimately get impaled, I was utterly shocked. Prior to this, I had found myself thinking, oh, here we go again. Who's going to make the save on her this time? Only to turn the page and discover that nope, no one did. So ironically enough, this was a nice misdirection by doing what we were told was likely to happen in the first place. I don't think I've ever experienced that with a manga before, so that was kind of cool. Made all the more effective to me by how it managed to, after this, segue nicely into a flashback for Rukia herself to reconcile her relationship with Kayen. This number nine Arankar has offered her the chance to exercise her demons by accepting that while Kayen's powers and body might be fighting her, his heart will always be with her. She lives on to carry his memory to not die alone. It's a wonderful conclusion to a great series of chapters and, ironically enough, was made all the better due to a gripe I believe I had with Bleach's action. And what's more is that unlike prior arcs where I've complained people tend to get stabbed only to then shake it off moments later, this arc keeps people down. Rukia get impaled? Well, she's out for the count now. And the same is true for Chad, so I really do appreciate that it creates more tension around the future fights that take place. 
I realize at this point, I probably should also explain what a good example of fights driving the narrative looks like. I've pointed out issues I've had with Bleach, so let's look at a story that I think does it quite well in places. So, we all know Dragon Ball. It's not the perfect series, but I have a fondness for it, and I think most of us know it pretty well. And one thing it does really well, I think, is using fighting to drive its narrative, particularly in Dragon Ball Z and early Dragon Ball. The Namek and Frieza arc is one of my favorite arcs of all time, and this is one of the reasons why. It's easy to interweave the narrative and importance into the more pivotal fights like the Ginyu Force and Frieza, so let's look at something a little more lower in scope and stakes. Vegeta versus Zarbon. They had two fights together, the two fights are very different, and they both tell two parts of a greater story. Initially, Vegeta strikes up a fight with Zarbon, thinking that he's the cat's pajamas, only to find out he's really the dog's dinner. That is until he recovers and comes back stronger than ever to overpower and kill Zarbon. This fight, in addition to telling a self-contained story of arrogance and struggle, also has significant consequences. Zarbon, one of the main people underneath Frieza, dies, and what's more is, without this fight, the Zenkai boost mechanic that was introduced wouldn't be nearly as clear as it otherwise ends up being. And so, if you remove this fight, the story itself makes much less sense as a result. And so, that's when you know you have for yourself a good addition to a story. When a fight ticks all these boxes, you've got yourself a fight that drives the narrative. And while I do love what the fights in this arc offer Rukia with her personal story and what they offer Chad with his physical development, I just wish that in addition to having an impact on the character's personal journeys, they would also have a greater consequence for the broader arc. I mean, within this section that I'm covering, Chad just goes to this realm to get a shield and sleep for a while. Okay, that's a bit harsh, but still. If the goal of this arc is to get Ichigo to trust in others more, why are we not using these characters to drive home the value of that mentality, instead of making these individuals just another name on a list of people that he has to save. But maybe this will be rectified in the next section, who knows, maybe I'm speaking too soon. It's not a huge deal, just something I thought was worth mentioning. <laughs> Stuff like this was really cool because Ichigo's priorities are evident for all of us to see in this interaction. And it sort of highlights what's interesting about Arankers when compared to Hollows. There's a nuance to how they go about things. They're all different in personality and morality to wild degrees, with many appearing totally innocuous and nice while others are, well, neutra. And in this case, Ichigo seems to have no interest or need to fight Ulkiora and just moves on until... <laughs> yeah, okay, fuck this guy. Following this, we turn the page and the once disinterested Ichigo walking away is seen clashing in an instant with this Aranka. It's an extremely effective use of the page turn too, by the way. And from that moment on, Ichigo just goes all out, but... This time, to no effect. I love the paneling in this short sequence. It's all laid out to make Ulkiora as clinical and matter-of-fact as possible, not to mention imposing. He doesn't boast or have much bravado about him, but he does watch, he does block, and he does tell it as it is, and he reveals to Ichigo that his best isn't enough, and that furthermore... He's only number four! Meaning there are three people stronger than him. He leaves Ichigo defeated after one strike and doesn't kill him? Now that's interesting, at least to me. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks as though he hasn't killed anyone yet. In fact, he's done the opposite, reprimanding that very behavior in Grimjow. And speaking of Grimjow, with Ichigo lying lifeless in the previous scene, he reminds me of why I love his character. <laughs> The plot just happens when this guy is on screen. Ichigo is great and all that, but it's so obvious why people love Grimjow. Unlike the majority of the characters in this story, he actually makes decisions that aren't reacting to something, and these decisions he actually makes have consequences. Along with Orihime, this guy is a driving force that keeps me engaged with the story. Grimjow just shows up at Ichigo's body, heals Ichigo with Orihime. That is a brilliant twist to the plot, by the way. It's interesting, and because we already have an idea of what Grimjow Grimjow is like as a character, we kind of understand why he's doing this. He wants a rematch, and hilariously, 
Once Ulkiora catches wind of this, the dude comes back into frame for like three seconds before Grimjo just puts him in time out for like three hours. And jokes aside, while it's not mentioned again in this section, this weird time out thing Grimjo uses here, it has to be a mechanic used in the climax of this arc. Its use here is just too perfect for it not to be. So I'm calling it now. This technique or whatever it is, is going to be used in the climax to some significant degree. It just has to be. The fight itself between Grimjo and the Bleach Man himself is brilliant and one aspect of it that really caught my attention is the amount of focus Ichigo's eyes receive from Orihime who starts to believe she can't see Ichigo in there anymore and on the opposite side of the spectrum, Grimjo remarks frustratedly that Ichigo always has this look in his eye. With or without the mask, perhaps alluding to the idea that we are all not simply one emotion or one component but instead a complex web of attributes and qualities that shine through at different times. The idea behind Ichigo's fight is that he is using the monster inside of him to achieve a goal and to do that he must put his more sensitive qualities to one side and embrace the more animalistic side of himself, thus creating what Grimjo sees in him when they fight consistently and the distance that appears between Orohime and what she's familiar with when she peers into him usually. However, it is important to point out that it's not entirely gone, in fact I would go as far as to say that that point is crucial. Pointed out to us during this fight when Onohime finally encouraged Ichigo that that part of him that's fighting for the right reasons is still there and it's in the driver's seat. And he's able to turn that positivity into physical results, thereby showing us the utility of that positive virtuous quality over simply losing oneself to base urges for war and pain. In other words, a controlled anger instead of a mindless storm. So this bit I found quite interesting as we get to interact with this legitimately threatening character while also learning a great deal about Nell. But before that... During this time, there's this other fight, and it's been a section of the story I haven't been showing a lot of love to in this review, and that's because, for the most part, Renji and Uryu, despite being characters I otherwise enjoy, their fights in this section honestly feel like afterthoughts. And as the other plotline that's currently running alongside the main one, it feels so much less interesting and consequential by comparison. And that sucks. I want to see these guys, but every time we switch to them, all I think about is how much longer I have to wait until we get back to the actual story here. And it's not because their fight is bad, but more so because it doesn't seem to proceed at all while we are spending time there. Anyway, back to Nell. This is the first conclusive piece of evidence that these high-level ranking Arankers aren't always evil creatures. They're not monstrous, but she does have monstrous power. However, she's from a time that has since passed and her power ranking is outdated, so let's see how she fares against this chap. There's a really good flashback to the previous fight Neutra number 5, then number 8, had with Nell following his defeat in their last duel in the past. It's filled with some really great quotes and here's a few. She says after he demands she kill him, we are humans who became hollows then regained our reason by becoming Arankers. Rational beings need a reason to kill, and you don't have one. Neutra, frustrated, says that he does, that he doesn't like her. And she responds, that's not a reason, that's an instinct. You're a beast. I don't recognize you as a warrior, and I refuse to burden myself with your life. Apart from being a cold as hell response from Nell here, the back and forth and really Bleach's whole philosophy when it comes to fight scenes has caused me to reflect quite a bit on what exactly makes a fight scene captivating. I spoke prior about how story structure can be communicated through fighting, but I think it's only fair I also draw attention to something Bleach does better than most other fight-centric stories with regards to its action. It's this notion of good versus evil, rational versus instinctual, light versus dark that seems to dominate not just manga, not not just Western media, but has permeated throughout most cultures. I don't want to get too broad and fundamental here, but I think Bleach taps into something sort of foundational when it comes to our appreciation as a species for fighting. When you look at fighters like Anthony Joshua, Tony Ferguson, and Conor McGregor, you see more than just a fighter, you see a story. It's one of the reasons why the WWE has been so successful and persistent across multiple decades. The fight itself is interesting, but it's the story that comes along with it that makes it the whole package. Speaking of 
as someone from Ireland, back in the day, my father, brothers, and heck, even my work colleagues would go on and on about how amazing Conor McGregor's journey was. How he came from virtually nothing and put it all on the line every single night to achieve his goal. We watch for that story. We see ourselves in that tale. And when opportunities presented themselves where the hero of the story falls, we get further engrossed because those are the moments that define us. Will the darkness in those moments you needed to channel in combat overtake you and define who you are? Or will you be able to push forward and do the right thing irrespective of your circumstances? In the case of Conor McGregor following his second fight against Dustin Poirier, it's clear to see what happened. Confused and ashamed, he spewed vulgar, nothing insults out of instinct. A pathetic final gasp to keep fighting for the sake of it, despite the conclusion already having been reached. And I think Bleach is playing with those same ideas foundational principles of not just fighting but vicarious storytelling that we as a society look to for inspiration. Can we see someone go to the brink, put themselves into that dark place and emerge once again as intact, rational and good people? Or will they become a slave to the very darkness that they utilized? A monster lacking in rational thought, fighting out of, as Nell puts it, instinct. Concerning Bleach, this becomes particularly interesting when we add a Arankers into the mix. At this point, we've clearly seen where Hollows come from, and we also understand that Arankers themselves come from Hollows. But not all Arankers are monsters, sort of in the same way that not all Soul Reapers are good and not all Quincy's are bad. So what does this mean? It further adds a layer of grey nuance to each encounter, proving that Arankers, by virtue of being what they are, do not necessarily mean that they themselves have been consumed by that very dark darkness Ichigo is so afraid of. But yeah, these are just the thoughts I have following this section as Nell returns to being a child and the fight becomes less interesting, albeit a bit more exciting, with the addition of a certain someone. Don't lose your way. The dude absolutely bodies Tesla in a single hit and just says, next, as if it was nothing. I love this guy. His nonchalant demeanor is infectious and it's with this wave of awesomeness ride the other captains in Kimpachi's stead. All arriving on the scene of the down members of Ichigo's party, Chad, Rukia on the verge of death, but now all with a very good chance of survival, it's an exciting turn of events. This dude Byakuya fights has a power where he can take control of bodies where he places this symbol on them. Regardless of this, Byakuya is ruthlessly confident, severing the connective tissues to his limbs that get compromised instantly. And then Rukia gets possessed. Byakuya uses his Bankai and thus creates more objects than his enemy can control, ending the fight and oh look, he appears behind them. That's another trope I've recognized in these scenes for characters to do during fights. However, while I don't find the structure of these fights themselves interesting, I do oftentimes find that I enjoy the substance of them with regards to the stories that they are telling. How he's fighting might not be interesting, but why he's fighting in this instance is sort of telling. Not from a place of authority anymore or with a sense of duty, but for his family. For, as he puts it, his pride. It's a nice indication that he's developed from the place he was prior to the Soul Society. Kurotsuchi's fight, on the other hand, is a lot more complicated. He's just as callous and psychotic as ever, making quick work of his opponents alongside Uryu. From a plot perspective, it's again not that complex, but from a back and forth perspective, it goes through the phases of combat for quite a bit. With this horrific shot of Kurotsuchi's assistant ultimately being used as a host to rebirth the Arankers they're fighting. It's gross and morbid, however, Kurotsuchi has a contingency more sadistic than anything we've heard in this story. Like something taken straight out of Black Mirror, he drugs the Arankar such that his senses are altered to perceive time and movements impossibly slowly, making his death at his hands slow and agonizing. Centuries of dying. What a hell that must be to endure. Similarly to Byakuya's fight, the structure is repetitive and predictable. It's the substance, however, that provides the interest. Kubo's fights have terrific artwork, flow, character moments. I just wish they had a bit more variety when it came to the fight's main beats themselves. Anyways, back at the Kenpachi fight. The fight rages on, and of these three fights, it's this one which is the most competitive. This has a lot of wonderful moments again, lots of standards shown in fanfare, but again, I find myself asking how necessary this fight is to the overall finish to this arc. I think Neutra's backstory is interesting, but the fight itself felt quite 
bong to me. Perhaps it's just because this Hueco Mundo section of the story has a lot of fighting, and at this point it feels less like a necessary component of the arc itself and more so a formality, if that makes sense. While Byakuya and Kurutsuchi demonstrated some change from when we last saw them, I don't think it's enough to justify over 10 chapters to these guys in the middle of everything. It feels sort of like we're doing these fights out of an obligation because there are so many Arankers and so we decided to drag these characters into the picture to give us a break from the main cast, to add variety. And while it does do that, it feels more like a bandage rather than a solution. And so, as a result, I think of all the fights that take place following Ukiora being locked away, most of them felt like they were biding time for me. Now, some of them are much more enjoyable than others, but take out this character or that character on the Aranker side and not much is lost in terms of story outside of an obstacle for the heroes to overcome. And that's the last thing a manga that communicates through fighting wants. The fighting shouldn't be an obstacle that gets in the way of the story, it should be the story. And this particularly feels like it's the case when chapter 313 comes to an end, and Orihime is literally yeeted from before Ichigo and transported back to Aizen in an instant. This does create an obvious goal to continue the story, and it does broaden it through the introduction of a threat to Karakura Town, following Kenpachi reminding Ichigo that that's his town to protect, but to remove Orihime from them in what feels like a very cheap fashion just robs a large chunk of this arc, and particularly this section, of so much. All of this time I was waiting for Ukiora to suddenly reappear and start complicating things again, but instead this sort of feels like a soft reset of the status quo. Now. It's not uninteresting, so don't get me wrong. There are elements I'm still very excited for. I'm just a little perplexed as to what exactly the point was of dragging us narratively through this dimension and all of these fights if we're being forced to go right back to the beginning having not come closer to achieving our goal. The only difference is that Ichigo and co are trapped in this area still looking for Oruhime. Now that's a good ending I guess and it builds sufficient tension for the final act of this three part story but the way they got to this point felt at times quite bloated. I can appreciate this middle section in Hueco Mundo divulging a lot of necessary exposition and did elevate Ichigo's abilities which I'm sure will come in handy with this upcoming section. But given how long it was, I feel like it could have been made significantly shorter without losing anything and might have even seen some benefits by cutting out the fights that mattered the least. With all of that said I think, despite certain characters interactions and conflicts feeling less than important or consequential, I will say that I enjoy this world Kubo is building and I am still very interested in the climax he's building too. Of these two sections I covered, I think I enjoyed the first part a lot more, but I will say that Kubo's art style and artistic approach to making manga is so up my alley that even reading through less than interesting fight sequences didn't matter much to me as I could breeze right on through them with ease. But I can also appreciate that I might have been singing a very different tune had I been reading this week to week, so there's that caveat. Next week will be the conclusion of this very long Arankar arc. My interest is still intact despite some hiccups I did quite gel with in this section, so I hope I can count on seeing you all there for the conclusion to this review series of the Arankar arc next week. But until then, I've been Toy Not Mark, and thank you all so much for watching.